Sasriyakal. That's a Sikh greeting, which means the light and truth in me sees the light and truth in you. I was walking to school. I'm eight years old, and I get tripped up by a boy from my school. My head smashes onto the pavement. There's blood everywhere. My nose is broken. I get to school with my hands cover, covering my face. And when the two of us are brought in front of the teacher, we're asked what happened. And the boy says, I just wanted to check whether her blood was red or brown. He had genuinely never seen a brown, a brown person or a non-white person before. Why were we living in the roughest council estate in Europe? That's what the police asked us when our corner shop was petrol bombed. We lived in a small village between Gloucester and Cheltenham called Churchdown. Let me take you back to my grandparents. We're Sikh. 80% of the Indian military is Sikh. So during the British Raj, when India, England was fighting in the Second World War and the First World War, Sikh soldiers were with them. And then when England was being rebuilt, Sikhs and Indians were asked to come and help. So my father, grandfather, came on the day of my father's birth to England. And he moved, he was brought to a, the black country in the Midlands and lived in a town called Smethwick, or in a part of Birmingham called Smethwick. Just last year, the first Sikh soldiers, or the first statue of a Sikh, went up in Smethwick. A proud soldier with a turban on his head. When, after about 21 years, my grandparents moved back to India after their work had been done, and my father, the age of 21, went to visit them. He saw a girl on a bike going through their fields, and he said, I like her. My grandfather said, don't worry, we can sort this out. <laughs> and so he went to my, my mother's home and asked for her hand in marriage for his son. And my grandmother said, oh, that's convenient because we're about to emigrate to America and we can't take my daughter because she's over 16. We can only take our children, the three children under 16. So this is perfect. My mother had never seen my father, never spoken to my father. There was no interaction. And on the day of her wedding, she had a scarf covering her face. So even on the wedding day, she didn't see him. So here is this ambitious medical student who loves color, loves dancing, loves poetry, loves life. And she's brought to the factory mills of England, of Birmingham. So this is why we ended up in Gloucester. Because my mother said, gosh, there's got to be some compromise. And she had a little bit of family in Wiltshire. So Gloucester's between Wiltshire and Birmingham. And a corner shop is what people did, so that's what we did. When I became 18, well, I've been working actually throughout my life since the age of seven when we bought the shop. I've been doing paper, you know, delivering papers and all kinds of work. So when I was 18, I was working for a flying school. So I went from my flying school to pick up my A level results. And when I came back, my boss, Roger Pullman, said, So what did you get? What happened? And I said, Oh, straight A's. And he said, You've got to call Oxford right now. Call right now. So I called and I was interviewed. And when I went to the shop to tell my mum, one of the customers in the shop said, oh, lots of pressure, Oxford. There's drugs, you know. I wouldn't send her there. And my headmistress said, oh, Mandeep, are all the other six acceptances that you got to, uh, during UCAS, are they too good for you now? And my mother thought about a white boy called Sebastian, whom I'm inevitably going to marry, and thought that she's going to lose her one and only friend in this village to the white elitists that she didn't, were in a place she didn't, where she felt really isolated and lonely, that she was going to become even more isolated and lonely, that she wouldn't even be able to speak her language to her grandchildren. And she said, please don't go. At that point, something in me changed. I realized that her values were not my values. That although, her, although she was wanting the best for me, just like her mother did, and she was valuing family and heritage and safety, my values 
wanted, well, they were thirsty for knowledge. And before I married off and facing death, i.e. marriage, same thing, I just wanted to see everything and live. So the next opportunity I got to study hard and get somewhere I didn't tell my mother. And I got a full paid scholarship to study in Melbourne. So I'm studying PPE in Melbourne. And there on my way back to England, I decided I'm gonna travel all the countries in between. This is my one chance. And then after that, I couldn't stop. So why is a girl like me traveling now over 150 countries? Because I just had to. I had to explore, I had to see. And this brings me to tonight and some of the values that I learned in these different places. So let me take you to Nicaragua. Some countries have artists, architects, or athletes as their national symbols and bearers of their national culture. Some are identified or defined by geography, political ideas, or religious culture. Nicaragua alone is a land that lives, breathes, and expresses its identity through poetry. There are more poets per capita than anywhere else in the world. The most famous and revered Nicaraguan, Ruben Dario, was a poet. The president, Daniel Ortego, was a poet in his youth, and so is the vice president, Rosario Moralio, and the two are married. Every year, the world of poetry descends on Nicaragua's cultural capital, Granada, for the International Poetry Festival, one that brings together verse writers from over 50 countries. And here you see that poets don't just narrate the nas national story. In Nicaragua, they actively help shape it. Nicaraguan poetry has been a weapon of revolution, the catalyst for social change, and a marker of national identity. Poetry has been a means to protest injustice, to record people's hardship, and a vessel for aspiration and dreams. Poetry has put Nicaragua on the map, as well as helping the nation to navigate through repeated political and social turbulence, the national history is a testament to the power of the written word and the role it plays in all our lives. Poetry helps us process what's going on around us and make sense of events we cannot always control. It is evocative, empowering, and above all, galvanizing, giving people a voice, an outlet, and representation. Poets convey suffering, they capture experience, and they translate hope. Everything, in other words, that makes us human. So that's Nicaragua bringing us to today. But then when I went to Georgia, I saw the power of word being used in a totally different way. There, toasting is extremely impo important. There's like a toastmaster for every meal, and meals are very important. So there would be a tostada, a toastmaster, in a, in a gathering. It could even be your family gathering. And he or she would insist on, firstly, explaining why we've all gathered, then giving recognition and gratitude to the host, then recognizing each and every person on the table, then recognizing our descendants and ancestors, then thinking about the future generation and the bridge between the two, then thinking about all the bittersweet moments that happened last year and how they've made this time so special and now we have lessons learned, and then thinking about, oh, well, maybe you've got something to say. And then each of them compete and want to recognize one another. For, and it goes on. And if you try and stand up because, you know, you're hungry or you're thirsty, that's really rude. We haven't finished recognizing one another. It's extremely powerful. And I saw a similar ceremony in South Africa. It's called Umbutu. When someone slips up in the South African uh, village, the tribe, for two days solid, gather around him or her and just say all the amazing things that they've done and remind them of who they really are. And, remember, and they believe that there's only goodness in us. And if you've made a mistake, it's simply that you, that was a cry for help. The last country I'd like to share would be Albania. Albania 
has this value of besa, which means word. Besa is worth more than gold. What is there apart from your word? And the kanun, which is a word or a law or the constitution, is describing the highest authority, one's word, promise, honor, and all responsibilities that it entails lie so close to the heart of Albanians that it's often referred to as Albanianism. This is why, during one of the darkest chapters in, for the nation, when millions of Jews, gays, communists, and racial minorities were gathered up across Europe, Albanians fought to save complete strangers. While the Holocaust saw 90% of Poland's Jews killed, 77% 77 of those in Greece were killed. It is estimated that Albania emerged from the Second World War with a population of Jews 11 times greater than it had at the beginning. There is not a single known case of a Jew being turned over to the Nazi authorities during the, during the occupation. And so Albania was recognized as righteous among nations by the Holocaust Memorial Museum. If we don't honor our word, our responsibilities, our families, then we have lost something essential to our sense of self. Being a true word, a principle that time and time again underpins trust and respect between people, being your besser says everything about you as a person. It is the last thing we should never allow ourselves to give up. This brings me to India. I'm obviously Indian. <laughs> We've established that. And the power of word in India is not just based on the meaning of the word, but the scriptures, the Sikh scriptures, are all in poetry. 1,400 words, all in verse. There's about 37 different languages represented, and about every third, fourth word is actually Farsi, so it's extremely lyrical. And it's written in this way because when you're in song, when you're in poetry, when, you're, when you gather together and sing these words, there's something that's also vibrationally extremely powerful. It changes your metabolism. It changes all your molecular biology. It changes your chakras. It changes your aura. It lightens you up. And you see it even in the physiology the way, you know, the way you breathe, everything and everything about you alters. So that's the power of word. Now this brings me to the words that are our values. If I were to put a hundred value words in front of you, you'd think, what is she talking about? I'm not really sure what my values are. But if I ask you, you to think back at last year or the year before, or maybe even when Brexit happened, a time when your values were violated. Think back in your past. And normally your values are formed when you were really young, before the age of 18. And as soon as they're stepped upon, you know what your values are. For some people, it might be as soon as they're lied to, they will walk out of a relationship or an institution and what the, if you really know, and I'll take you through an exercise, but once you figure out what your values are, to have those five key core values in your back pocket, those five words, the way you then make decisions, whether it's a big decision like where am I going to university, or the drumbeat of decisions that we come across in our everyday lives, how we spend our morning, what we eat, where we go to school, how we go to school, where we work, all these decisions are much easier to make once you've thought about your values, which it doesn't take much. It's all happening in your subconscious, but once you bring it into your consciousness, it's a game changer. And it leads to a much greater harmony in all your decisions and therefore leads to a more successful, fulfilling, and happy life. So give yourself a chance at the beginning of this decade, whether you take a 10-year period, five-year period, the next six months, Allow yourself a few minutes to think about what's really important to you, what you stand for, how you want to be known by the end of your life, and live your life according to your values, and you'll be in a much better place, a much happier place. Thank you.